So Revelation 22, verses 6 to 21. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for a time, the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me, to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates." Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and adulterers and everyone who loves and practices falsehoods. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Well, it's hard to believe we are finally nearing the end. In fact, tomorrow will be the final day in this book of Revelation. But, um, you know, Jesus has promised over and over that he would come quickly from chapter 1 all the way to the end, and, and, and that these events must soon take place, he says often, right? Chapter 1 through 19, even again here in, at the end in chapter 22. And Jesus did come. In the first century, he came as a baby, born to a virgin, and he rose, ray, uh, lived a life, bled and died, and he came again to the disciples, and then he ascended to heaven. He came again at Pentecost through the Holy Spirit. He also came to the seven churches as he promised that he would and comes to all churches now even yet today. He came in judgment at AD 70 as he promised to those still in Jerusalem, the Jews who had mocked him. And he was there to avenge the blood of the martyrs. He still comes to us when we know and when we kneel and we ask and we seek him and we ask him into our hearts, he comes into our lives. And when we live for him, well, we won't die alone and he will come to us in that final moment to come and take us home. But we don't know when he will come at the end of times, right? That second advent. But we do know when we gather together, he comes. When we fellowship with the, the church on Sundays and in, in discipleship groups, and when we fellowship over a meal with other believers, He comes and is in our midst. Acts one eleven says, In like manner that He went up, He'll come again. And we do believe in that second coming. We do believe that Jesus has come, He continues to come, and that He will come again one physical last time on that last day. That every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus came in the flesh, that is, they are of God. And they're against those spirits who are against Christ, that spirit of the Antichrist. But while we believe he comes into our hearts at, at, at salvation, well, verse 17 that we just read isn't an invitation for him to come to us, but it's an invitation for us to come to him. Good morning, Pat. 
like what Jesus told the woman at the well, if you knew the water I offer you, well, indeed, I give you water that will spring up, bubble forth, right? The Bible uses simple things to express profound thoughts. It's like water. Well, next to air, it's one of the most basic needs that we have, isn't it? When was the last time you thanked God for water? Right? We take it for granted sometimes. The salvation invitation is ours to come and to drink the water of life. Jesus wants to provide this water of life to all. To all. Some consider Revelation to be a fearful, a scary, strange book. We turn it into a fear-mongering thing. It's the, um, the thing to scare all, all good Christians into submission, right? Uh, in its really bad sense, if we aren't careful. Yet the intent was to encourage us, not to scare us. After 21 chapters, we find in this last chapter an invitation to come, to come and participate with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The true message of the church is triumph and victory, not defeat. Triumph and victory in Jesus, not fear and scary. In fact, in this final chapter, we see three very specific invitations to come and to see. Oh, wait, what was Jesus' first words? Remember that all the way back to the beginning with Philip? They said, Master, where do you lay your head? Or where do you eat? Where do you live? And he goes, well, come and see. Come and see. The first invitation was a call of the Spirit. The call of the Spirit. It's mirrored in John 6, that no one comes unless drawn by the Father. This is what we call prevenient grace, the drawing grace, prevening. It's going before, it's drawing, it's, it's what happens so that we can be saved, right? We testify of how we got saved, how we met Christ, but it didn't happen. And it all happens because God first initiated that offer. It's not irresistible. Right? That's a Calvinist view of the irresistible grace of God. That if you are predestined, that you can't resist the Spirit. Well, guess what? God, in His great love and mercy, draws all to Him. But the problem is, not all choose. You can refuse the move of God. John wrote as well that Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all all men unto me. That's not just the predestined. That's not just the frozen chosen. It was all. And all means all. He would draw all to him. He's drawing all, but not all will respond. We must accept it or reject it. Many are called, but few are chosen. Not because God willed only a few to be chosen, but because only a few respond, and God knows that. It's what we call cognitive, not causative. Cognitive in his foreknowledge, because God's above time, and he knows all the choices and all the ways that men will, and women will respond. He knows how our lives are already done. <laughs> he's seen it all. We're still living it, but he knows it, because he's above time. And in that cognitive he predestined in his foreknowledge he predestined when God calls he gives us the grace to choose our response you know we are too sick too weak too dead to get up on our own without his making a way first through his prevenient grace our message is not to resist the spirit to grieve to quench to resist to insult the spirit many times we get beyond the hearing range of listening to god and we can't hear so we don't respond even as believers sometimes we talked about that yesterday at church yet if we miss the first call here's the grace 
he keeps on calling us. He keeps on calling us. The second way that he calls is the call of the bride. He says, the spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit of the bride say, come, bride. The bride in 21.9 is the lamb's wife, right? Across scripture, the people of God are his bride, the church of God. The spirit is calling proveniently, and we must be in partnership to tell of Christ. We call people to God on our in our services, in our church services, in our revivals, in our meetings, in our discipleship programs, right? Every believer should be a part of this. The church is the bride. Our function is to lift up our voices to the lost and the hurting and repeat what we have heard Jesus saying and crying out. We preach the word of God. The sad thing is we get so detoured and distracted that we don't always follow the agenda of God, but our own. We don't duplicate the call of God, but we duplicate the call of the world sometimes. And yet we should duplicate the call of the Spirit. If you don't hear it during the weekly, uh, during the weeks, you know, while... It's maybe because we're not in our devotions, we're not praying enough, right? And we're not thirsty enough, but you should hear it at church through the worship, through the praise, through maybe the message, through the testimonies, through the fellowship. We are to call the thirsty and hungry to Jesus, for only he can satisfy. He is the water of life at no cost, Isaiah says. God, though, is so patient that he uses not just the call of the Spirit proveniently going before, challenging, convicting, and drawing, but he also uses the call of the bride to preach and to connect and to, uh, to, to build up the church so that he can also use the third thing mentioned, the call of the one who hears. Guess who that is? You, the believers, us. Jesus made atonement for all sins. He doesn't give up if they don't listen to that spirit right away. He doesn't give up when they don't listen on a Sunday service because actually we live in a very post-Christian growing day and age where not everybody just walks into the church. In fact, 9-11 was one of the very last times that we saw people flock into the church. And actually, maybe not even then. During the Gulf War, and war was, was announced and people flocked into the church. They needed some hope. 9-11 came, and yes, yeah, some flocked to the church, but not many. Many grew calloused. Today, we see a, a, a major devastations, and they aren't flocking to the church. We could go into many things as to why that might be. Sin in the church. It's sin in the camp. Sin of attitudes and actions. Sin of disagreements and disunity and disloyalty. Sin of, well, pride and arrogance. Sin. Haughtiness. Sin of forsaking the message and the call of the church to the lost. To build up the believer to send out and deploy. If we don't hear it during the week, we ought to hear it on Sundays so that we can go out. He uses those who have experienced the gospel in their lives, who share their testimonies of what God has done in their life. We proclaim what God has done for us, and this is a form that draws people to him. Sundays aren't the only time God is open for business. He's 24-7. He is this because he uses his people to preach the good news all week long through our attitudes and our actions to tell of what God has done through our words. If they don't come to the church, the church is to take the message to them. We get hung up not knowing what to say, afraid to offend somebody, and so we don't say anything. You know, you don't have to know all the scripture. You don't need to know the Romans wrote and have it memorized. 
all you need to do is to be one beggar telling another beggar where the meal is. Sharing of how God has shown up and shown off in your life. Has Jesus satisfied your deepest needs and longings and the needs of your heart? Has he been faithful to you? Then tell someone. We've all experienced God in one way, shape, or form. How he's shown up in our lives. Sometimes we forget, though, due to our present circumstances. And we need to, like the Israelites, be reminded of each and every time God has shown up. We need to sit down and, and journal and to comprehend and to remember all the times God has shown up and shown off. And we need to share of those times. Times where he's overcome our deepest griefs of loss. Times where he's overcome our deepest needs. Times where he's met us. Where he's touched our hearts. Where he's spoken to us in a real tangible way. Times where he has used us for his glory. Times where he's spoken through children where he's throw, spoken through the poverty around us, where we've seen his need, where we've been desperate. You don't have to have a story of alcoholism and drug use and all kinds of major running away from God to be used by him. I can think of countless times God has shown up and shown off in my life. Financially, through our adoption process. Shown up in saving us from a cave where we should have died. Shown up and shown off in so many ways. Guiding, directing. And that is the message that calls other people to him. But you know what? You don't know how to use that testimony when all you do is speak. God calls us to listen. God calls us to walk alongside people, to hear what their need is, and to respond by sharing how God can fill that need. But the problem is, we as believers sometimes are quick to speak and not slow to listen. Oh, we are slow to listen. Instead, what does Scripture tell us? That we should be slow to speak. Right? Quick to listen, slow to speak, and even slower to get angry. But we turn that around. We're quick to get offended. We're quick to get mad and argue. And so we're fast to speak, and we listen oh so slowly. I pray God will challenge you on how you listen. You say, well, I don't know any unsaved people. Oh, listen. But I don't, I don't know how to meet their need through Christ. Well, listen. You know, it doesn't take but one or two times of meeting somebody who is waiting on my table at a restaurant before I can very quickly sense and hear they're having a bad day. Can I pray for you? It doesn't take long before they share things. We had a waitress that had shared many deep things about their family and yet, they didn't know that I was a pastor. They just knew that I cared and would listen. And that when they said, hey, how are you this morning? And I said, I'm okay. How are you? That it was genuine. 
Sometimes that's through a joke, right? When they say, oh, I'm good. And I say, are you really? And they stop and they go, yeah, not really. When you listen, God will give you every opportunity, even to that cashier in line. It's one good reason not to use self-checkout. May we be people who listen so that we can be a part of the call of the Spirit, the call of the church, the bride, and the call of the one who hears. So God, I pray that you would open our ears to be able to hear not just from your Spirit, but also to hear the hurt around us, the need. We are quick to preach. We are quick to call people to come kneel at the cross and, well, we want to take out their kneecaps. We want to be the conviction, and yet the Holy Spirit is already drawing and convicting. We don't got to do it for them. All we got to do is listen to their needs, listen to what they are longing for, listen to their hurts, listen to their pains. Because I, am, I can guarantee that God will bring people in your path who are dealing with things that you've dealt with. Oh, that pain in your past, the, the trial and the temptation and the testing you went through, they were for God's good and his glory, and he wants to redeem them and use them by getting you to share. And through listening, we get to speak about what God is doing. Lord, use us. Open our ears to the hurts around us. Open our ears to hear and shut our mouths so that we do truly understand what that scripture verse means. To be quick to listen, slow to speak, and even slower to get angry. For your glory and your praise, we give this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll go in peace. And uh, I pray you have a great rest of this wonderful afternoon.